It is noon officially now, so I guess I'll get started. This is going to be uh, recorded, and I will post it to our training page where we post all the videos. Um, just to let you know, this is a lunch and learn. It's a new thing we're trying out where it starts at noon, and I do much shorter topics. Um, in the past, I've done like an hour to an hour and a half type of things. These are going to be within an hour. Um, so it's just one quick topic, and today's topic is the tall analyst add-in, which is an add-in that comes with SOLIDWORKS Professional. So you already have it on your machine. You just have to turn it on is the thing. Um, and what it lets you, allows you to do is do tolerance stacks. So unfortunately, it's not a perfect world. So over here on the left, don't know why that zoomed in for me. Don't zoom in. Um, hey, here we go. Uh, on the left, you see that the higher the tolerance you get, because nothing's perfect, you have to give them well, you can get within this, plus or minus that. The smaller the tolerance, the more the price on the part's gonna go up. So to keep it reasonable so we can afford it, you have to give them some plus or minus, and that's where we get to the area over on the right, where you start getting a stack up of your tolerances. Stop zooming. <laughs> All right. Um, so, that's what we're going to do. The first thing you need to do is you need to have a model, you know, a three-dimensional model that you're going to interrogate. So here I've got this um, little boxer engine. If we do a section of it, whoa. that's one. Here we go. Um, if I just do a quick section on this thing, we could take a look at the parts involved. Uh, you know, it's a model that's got the mates built in there. So I can see the range of motion that I've got. And I want to find out, you know, how close when this thing hits top dead center, how close to the top is it getting? And I've got a lot of tolerances going as far as you saw on the last slide, how tall the cylinder and the head are and how tall the rod and the piston are together is going to give me the distance between them. So this is a really complex model. It's got, you know, nuts and bolts and washers and stuff in there. Do not use one of these for your tolerance analysis. I found that out. If you try and use two, um, you know, uh, detailed of a model, it starts to bog down and it can possibly crash. So what I've done instead is I've got a simplified version, which is the parts that are um, the ones that I'm worried about on the stack up. So I've got the piston, the head, the crankshaft, and all the outside pieces. But I don't need all the nuts, bolts, and washers, stuff like that. That's just going to be overhead that I don't need. So I actually just created a brand new assembly, made it up so the thing was always at um, top dead center so I can get true distance on what's going on here. So the first thing you need to do is you need to model it up so that you've got the three-dimensional um, type of thing to do your tolerance analysis on. The next thing is you need to put in the tolerances themselves. I'll go to this last page. I try and stay out of PowerPoint as much as possible. Um, but what we need to do is we need to put on GD&T, uh, or also called GTAL. It stands for uh, Geometrical Dimensioning and Tolerancing. Um, I did mention that we were going to be posting this class a little later. If you want to see all the classes that we've done, go slash X Mechanical. Takes you to the home page where that's, there's our team right there. Um, but they've got a training and tutorials page. I just started posting these lunch and learns. Here's last month's. Today's will be here. Um, but I've also got one that goes in for an hour on what GDNT is. And I didn't want to redo what GDNT is. That's even really doing it light work. If you want to take a GDNT class, it takes about a week to get all the nuances on what exactly is going on. But what it is is basically you're taking the geometry of the part and saying, okay, this face is a datum, this face is a datum, and you're putting on tolerances and these control panes to tell them exactly what you want. So let me open up a part here. 
like this one. Okay, so you should be used to these tabs up here, property manager, uh, configuration manager, but there's also this one here, DIM expert manager. And the terminology gets a little goofy. Um, DIM expert was what they called everything before 2019. Um, for some reason, they decided to call the toolbar that does it MBD Dimensions in 2019. It used to be called DIM Expert, but it's the same toolbar. It does the same thing. What this basically does is it allows you to take datums and put place, um, you know, what is critical on your part. Uh, the way that I've learned best to do it is to put your datums on first thing. So I say, okay, that's A. Yeah, B right here, we'll do C, and then one for this direction, do a D. So that's like the datum tool that you're used to using um, inside of your annotations when you're in a drawing, but you'll see that these hang things have this little blue color here. And when I'm in this dim expert and I start putting on these datums, it starts picking out what feature are we going to use to measure these things off of. Is this clear so far? No surprises yet? Okay, just let me know if you guys have any questions. Other things that are on this toolbar Where did it go? Here it is. Yeah, it's a little hard to uh, There we go. Okay. So different kinds of uh, dimensions that I can put on there. I can put on basic dimensions, or I can put on dimensions of size or dimensions of location. So if I say let's put in a dimension of size, and I pick this, of course it will go to the parametric dimension that you've got inside of your part. It's going to be the same size that you modeled it. But we're not using sketch dimensions. We're not using um, you know, dimensions from the features, the parametrics. We're measuring the actual geometry, which is part of the whole GD and T trick that you're using faces on the model. So when I click it in, notice that it's giving me this little 2.54 millimeter thing. That's nice. I'm going to make it a little less uh, inch centric and take off the four from the end there. But now I've got the size of this diameter with some tolerances on it. And you'll see that once I put it in, it figures out that that is data A. If you've got a dimension like that selected and you go over here to put in a geometric tolerancing frame, you can start calling out some items like I want this thing to be a true cylinder. I also want this one to have a dimension here. And it keeps coming up with this 2.54. I'll show you where it's getting that dimension in a second here. Again, it links it up to the datum for me automatically, and I can put in a tolerance. The last one I did, when you're doing like planar or cylindrical, you're really just setting up what your what your primary datum is going to be. You want it to be a nice, perfect, flat surface or a, a smooth cylinder, that sort of thing. But once you get into where's this part going to be, you can start doing things like profile or position tolerances. And those come with modifiers. You know, this is a, a radial dimension, so I can put the tolerance in with a diameter. You have uh, most material, least material. You can do those sorts of things. Also, it's watching what you're doing. I put in a lowercase. See, it says there is no such thing as a lowercase a datum. You need to have the real name of the datum, and it is case sensitive. So when I do a capital A, it's fine with it. So I'll put the cap lock on here. And it'll tell me whether or not that'll work. You'll see the C one. It doesn't make sense with this type of datum that I'm doing. So it does have some intelligence built into it. As far as, you know, you can't just write garbly gook in there. It does have to be a real frame and match up to datums that you have on your part. Uh, or else it'll flag you. Of course, you can put on that bad one, but you should really just pay attention to the flag that's giving you. So, okay, those are uh, a couple of dimensions I was showing you using these. This one down here, the size dimension. There's also a dimension if you're going to have tolerances for a distance. Let 
There we go. Again, it's putting in those crazy 0 0.004002. That's coming from my template. The other type of dimension that you can put in is just a basic dimension, which doesn't have tolerance. You're trying to hit that one perfectly, or that's the one that they're really striving for. And a lot of times that'll tell them what's critical when they're looking at your model. Thing is, if we if we open up a drawing, you're going to need to like show your annotations and show dim expert. These are not the same as the dimensions that are typically coming from a model, from your sketches, from your features, or things like that. They're their own thing. They're reading off geometry, so there is a little bit of a disconnect. But you want to be aware of that. So why did they do it like this? I mentioned that in 2019 they started calling this toolbar MBD dimensions. Uh, MBD stands for Model Based Definition. And what that means is hopefully sometime in the future, you just send a model to a vendor, single model. It's got all your tolerance, it, it, tolerances. It has the three-dimensional geometry. It's all you need. You don't have to send them a model and a drawing with all your tolerances. The thing is, is that if you do want to send out an MBD, like a 3D uh, PDF or a step file, which is a new type of step file that they're doing, um, step file 242, which actually has those tolerances embedded into them. So when the vendor gets it and opens it up and his machining or whatever, if it's set up to read MBD, all the tolerances come in for him. Um, so the idea is the paperless office. We're still not there. And if you're hoping on doing this with your vendors, uh, you're going to need to buy the MBD package. This is not that add-in. They just named it that way to kind of get people pushed towards that direction but I'm still definitely just using the DIM expert. I hope that clears it up. We'll see. Any questions so far? How do you do a mid plane? Would you have to make a, like a reference plane? Yeah, so if you're doing that, and, and typically you don't want to do mid planes with geometric tolerance, because that's the whole point, is we want geometry to measure off of, not a theoretical thing. Uh, but you can set up whatever you want. If you pick um, these selection faces, um, I can set this one as a width with that one. Um, oh, oops, I hit the green check mark there. Nope, didn't do it. Let me try it again. So I'm sorry, his question was what if uh, you wanted to make a mid plane or something like that? You can set up a width um, between two places, which will set up basically that they're their equal distance from that. And even if you grab a bunch of them, like for this thing, I would probably want to pick all four of those spaces and say those are all the same width. Also, when you do that type of stuff and you put in your MBD dimension, it'll call out the time four on you when you put in that dimension because it sees that you've already done that. Typically, if you're going to do that type of stuff, you want to do that first. It's also a good idea, like on the, on the casting, like this part here, uh, you can do a collection where you, where you tell it that that face and that face are the same face. Even though there's a, there's a break between them, you can say, I want those to be on the same plane. If you group them together, like I just did on that, SOLIDWORKS will see that, oh, these are both data may type of thing. Well, both surfaces should be the same. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. All right, so I can go through and put all the dimensions on here. It seems like a lot of busy work because I already put all the dimensions on when I designed the thing. Um, you can see how close you've gotten to getting this done. If there's a green face, it means it completely knows where that is. If there's a yellow face, it still needs a little bit more information to lock it down exactly. If there's no color, you haven't really called that out at all. So if you want to do it quick, and here's that whole MBD thing, if you're sending out something, uh, you can do a, a limited dimension drawing like we do in our paper drawings here, where you don't have to put every dimension in. If you call out, hey, anything I didn't say is held to this tolerance, you can do the same universal here, the general profile, profile tolerance. If you...
put that in, and then you check the color. Oh, it did not let me do that. Let me try that again. I think I'm talking too fast here. Will not let me delete it. Okay, let me try that again. Edit general. Oh. Something that's really goofy on the uh, selection that they have you do is that if you if your primary and secondary are not perpendicular to each other, it chokes on it, um, which I've been trying to figure out a good workaround for, but um, have yet to do so. Let's see if this works. There we go. Okay, and now when I uh, when I hit this little plus minus here. It lets you know what you have called out. Remember when I had just put on a couple? It just called out those two as green. Now that I've said a universal one, said, hey, everything I didn't mention, put this tolerance on. It's still fine, except for where this D is. Um, I'm sorry, this C. If I were to put another one of those size dimensions on, this one, and then call that out just like I did with the other lobe. Probably want to get them the same so the thing isn't lopsided. There we go. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't stay on, but you see that now I've got it all green. So um, you can do a limited dimension. You don't have to put in every tolerance. Just the ones that are critical for you is fine. And then you can put the overall. Um, but once you get that thing green, you know that if you sent this out as MBD without any type of drawing, the person could get this information. Since we don't have the MBD add-in, you can send this out in an e-drawing if you want to start the MBD today. Um, but that's the workaround for getting this information out to a vendor. All right, so I'm just gonna save this. I don't need to save it. Because if you don't do uh, the tolerance, you'll end up, if, if you don't do a uh, limited dimension, you're gonna end up with something like that, where it shows every possible face, where it's supposed to be and what the tolerance is. And you see, it keeps giving me these two five fours, five oh eights. Let's take a look at that a little bit more. All right, where it's getting those initial tolerances that it's just sort of throwing out there uh, shotgun style is actually within the part. If I go into the options, And I never look for anything anymore. You just do a search here and it'll find the stuff for you. Here it is. On the document properties, there's a whole dim expert thing. So here's your um, different styles, whether you're going to do a block or a general. And you'll see that as you turn it on, you can only fill out the information for whichever one you're using. The other thing are these. So when those were saying 254, 508, it's because these were set to that. So you need to go in and set these if you are going to use this. And if you save it into your template, that'll be the next part, you know, we'll already have these settings. But just to let you know, when it throws in those numbers, where is it getting those numbers? It's actually getting the numbers from the file that you're in right now. Okay, I still like to put in my initial datums myself, um, and I'll show you why in a second. 
Um, it will start off at whatever letter you started off with last. So I'll reset that one to A. I want this one to be B, and I'll pick a flat face as C. Okay, remember, I'm using these datums from this tool right here. I'm not using the annotation dimensions that you use like in a drawing or something like that because they don't have the same effect. These ones will actually be read in, and you'll see that when I grab those datums, it goes and finds the feature that it's using for that datum and shows it to you graphically. In the last one, I was picking exactly what I wanted. This is critical, this is critical, this is critical. Um, I can also... You know, go in here and just say, okay, let's do it auto style. With that, you can pick your datums. This one will get, gets me every time that if you click the next one, you're just resetting what the primary datum is. When you pick your first one on the screen, if you ever see that symbol, that means that if you hit your right mouse button, it goes to the next item in the tree. So I can pick these here. Remember that this one and this one, if they're not perpendicular, it'll throw back. I can't do this for you. So for whatever reason, you have to do them in that order. Also, it's kind of important whether or not you use this prismatic or turned. So turned is just for parts that are put on a lathe. Basically, um, you get a lot of run out uh, um, geometric tolerancing when you do that. Uh, when you do prismatics, mostly surface and position, less than dealing with the, you know, how it is axially. Also, whether or not you're just going to do plus or minus dimensions, but if you tell it to do geometric tolerancing, it will actually look through the part and try to put in frames that it thinks are relevant. Um, of course, whenever a computer starts guessing like that, you do want to double check what it came up with as far as what frames it put on where, but it did things like it grabbed the datums for me first and made sure they were perpendicular and round and in the position that I wanted, um, and that kind of stuff. So it does do a pretty good job at guessing, but you do want to go back through that because that's what SolidWorks thinks you want to make as far as MBD. And notice that every place it put on a dimension, it flags you know what face or what cylinder it's using for that particular uh, dimension. Can you change that? Or you want to yeah, if you hit delete, okay. so it'll go away, and now I have to re-tell it where that cylinder is because I took off the control frame for it. Um, now I'll find out if control Z works, which it doesn't. Okay, <laughs> it's all right. If it uh, it can resolve the whole thing, just want to make sure you pick up the. Same datums that you had before. And this is one of those things where it's just going to solve, you know, whatever's missing, puts it back. So unfortunately, the undo doesn't work on that, but you can just have it resolve. As long as you're using the same uh, datums, it should come up with the same choices for you. There's different settings on what you want it to do automatically. Uh, whoops. Remember that spot I was in? So, so the question was, how come, it, how come it knew to do maximum material here and things like that? Um, it seems like it's smart, but it's, it's really not that smart. It's just going off a script that you give it. Um, again, you know, as you go through the DIM expert here, you can start um, – talking about the types of controls that you're going to do, things like that. Um, and if you're not happy with them, you can double click on it. There you go. And it comes up with the frame. I can change that. Does that answer your question? It sure does. Excellent. Then I'll move on. All right. So I'm going to save this and go back into that simplified assembly that I did. Now, I've done this for every part. If the part does not have uh, that MBD or DIM expert stuff on it, it doesn't have the measurements needed for the plus or minus. It's just going to come out with your minimum is this number, your maximum, it's all the same number because there's no tolerances. So if you want something to be included in the tolerance stack up, you need to make sure you go through, put those measurements on every component that you've got.
Okay, just seeing where the heck I am. So I've got this thing at top dead center where I want it to be. You need to make sure that this add-in right here is on. Tall analyst. That comes with SOLIDWORKS Professional. So you already have it. Uh, all you need to do is either go to this add-ins tab or go to your tools add-ins. There's a checkbox for something called tall analyst. The only reason you will know it's available is right here. I showed you this dim expert tab. That's where I was putting on the dimension or the, the MBD inside of the part. At the assembly level, I've got this right here, tall study. If that is grayed out, you don't have the add-in on. You turn it on, it becomes available. And it has a wizard that it first thing, everything needs to be set to resolve. This stuff opened up with some stuff in lightweight. That's fine. I'll say, yeah, let's resolve it. Um, you can ask it not to ask you that again, and then it'll resolve it all the time. But I left it on just so you guys could see how thrilling it is when it pops that up. All right. And it's come up with nothing yet. Now that they're resolved, it's going to let me do it. So I have to pick the two spaces that I'm after. I want to find out how close the head of this piston comes to the top of the cylinder head, from the bottom of the cylinder head. OK, and you'll see that it puts in a little dimension. Click it there. Your first instinct, just because you're a good SOLIDWORKS user, is to hit that green check mark. Do not hit that green check mark. All you have told it is that that space is eight, which is true. But this is sort of like the uh, hole wizard in the feature manager right there. Come back to the thing and show you guys on screen right here. It's got a next button. That's what you want to do. If you just say OK, it just puts that eight in there and we're done. Uh, you can edit it and go further. But what you really want to do is hit next. So OK, what am I supposed to do now? Hopefully, everybody knows from my classes that there's always a question mark inside of any property manager that'll take you to the help page. The help on the tall analyst is pretty complete. Um, I didn't want to read this off verbatim. I don't know if I could have done that in an hour anyways, because it's several pages deep. But they talk about creating the assembly, you know, talk about whether your parts, since it is going off the, the geometry, if you've got a face that's not perpendicular to other ones, it's not going to assume that they're supposed to be. So, um, you know, go through these helps if you are going to start using this tool, can help you out a little. But for the main thing, I want to start it out with what part is going to stand still, what's, what's the base part that all this stuff is holding on to. So I'm going to go with this half of the engine block that I've got here. Automatically, if you look down here in the lower left, it has found all of the parts that are neighboring that part, that are mated to that part. So the parts should be mated together. Um, I was having problems with parts that are just fixed in space and things like that. Sometimes it can't really tell the orientation of them because they're just locked in X, Y, Z. It doesn't realize, oh, this thing's supposed to sit with the cylinder of this, or this is supposed to fit over the whole of that. So you do have to have them mated together. And it has made them, you can just pick right on the screen and say, okay, that's one of the neighbors I want. Here's another one. There we go. So it'll turn them solid to show you that those parts are now part of the design. You'll see actually in this simplified one, I only have one component left, which is the um, wrist pin. I don't really need that because that actually has nothing to do with the tolerance on this part. The height of the rod and where the hole is drilled in the cylinder head is going to make all the difference. The pin itself is just going to be fat or thin. It's not going to help with the stack up as long as it's you know, concentric. All right, so that's the, the first thing you do. Get your measurements in there, which is your DIM expert. Next thing you do is you say, okay, here's where the parts can, here's where the assembly is measured from. And then you pick all the pieces in the stack. This is the one why you need to do a simplified assembly. Because what this next page is going to do 
is it's going to go through and take a look at the components that are in the sequence and take a look at how they're mated together and you have to tell it which mate is critical here. So I'll just be patient. There we go. Yikes. So the more complex the part, the more edges, the more faces, the more holes, the more of this kind of stuff you're going to do. And the more parts that are in the assembly, the more it gets confused as to what exactly you're going for. But what I want to do is I want to tell it what I consider the most critical here. So when I select on a component, hopefully this next one has less faces and edges. I'd be careful with this one because I did uh, get this thing very near the edge when I was playing around with this earlier. Okay. So they need to work on this uh, interface. Obviously, it's pretty kludgy uh, and very difficult to read. This is actually better since it is a simplified assembly. Before, I could not even see what I was trying to pick because of uh, the amount of stuff that it was putting on there. Uh, I'm also not terribly sure if it's running or not. So once this turns green, when you select the one that you're after, man, it's killing me. What is the question mark there, Lars? Is that for, is this undefined, the part? Is that so what this has to do is, so, so the parts are mated together, right? And so it's taking a look at all the ways that these parts could be mated um, from the geometry on the part. And you're, what I'm picking here is I'm picking the plain ones. I don't care really about the concentricity as much as how they're stacked uh, in, a, in the planes. Um, but unfortunately, there's so much information that it's trying to look at here. Man, I hope this thing's not, this is what was keeping me up all night. Um, hey, I finally got it. Let's go to the next part. Let's look at the mason is deciding. It's not deciding anything. It's asking me to make the decision. It's showing me all the ways that this thing is lined up with the other parts around it. And I have to say, this is the critical one um, in this example. Yeah, it, it's pretty horrible. And it should really, from the distance that I'm asking, you think that it could narrow it down and be like, these concentrics over here have nothing to do with even that plane that we're in. Um, but the thing is, is that you want to get all of these to do green check marks or else you don't get the next arrow here. I just have to wait. Uh, luckily, 2019, I guess I should take this moment. See that little hourglass there? It's new from 2018. 2018 did not have that hourglass, so a lot of times you'd click and it'd say, I'm doing something, wait. Uh, 2019 lets you know that it's doing something and you should wait. So I guess I am. See? All right. Is this kind of like the limit, like you shouldn't do assemblies larger than this? Um, I think it has to do with the amount of, because I've got these fins in here, the cooling fins, I think is what's killing me. It's the amount of detail. So if I had a simplified cylinder, um, I, this would work easier for me. Um, one would hope. Right, and I already had to do that because um, I couldn't even get through this example with the whole assembly. I was trying that at first and that was uh, that was even more painful than this. I really just wish I knew what it was doing at this point. <laughs> OK. 
Come on, SolidWorks. Do something for me. Whew. I was worried I was going to not have enough time, but if I'm waiting 20 minutes in between clicks, uh, I might run out of time. Does this work better on your desktop? This works better when no one's watching. Um, I was just curious for the processing yeah. power. Like I was doing it on the on the laptop earlier. Um, sometimes I would have issues and sometimes I wouldn't. I really should have restarted this, I think, is my problem here. Um, okay, we're down to the last one. Yay. So, okay, I get this. Finally. Whew. I can wake up from my nightmare. That is rough. I agree that that interface right there, they got to do something about that page. But once you get through that page, it does give you some really good information that would have taken me a long time to figure out by myself. So let's take a look at the results. Okay, see when they're blue and pointing outward, you're looking at the max. Switch it to the min, they'll be red and pointing towards one another. But we can see that, you know, when I made the CAD, it was exactly eight millimeters away. Okay, if we do the worst case where I've got a really tall piston and rod and a really short head and cylinder, um, that's going to be 7.29 on my min. If we go the other way where I got a big cylinder head and a small piston and rod, it's going to be 8.7. So that's great, especially for if you're just doing one-offs and that kind of stuff. Um, what the RSS min and max have to do, that has to do if you're going into production. So the odds of you hitting all minimum and all maximum are very, very small, right? You get a bell curve whenever you're doing each tolerance where the high and the low are going to be rare if you get them. So what RSS does is called root sum squares. It takes all those tolerances and basically finds the middle of the bell curves for you and then gives you the middle of that bell curve. So that is in production, most likely what you will be hitting. You're not gonna be getting all talls and all smalls. You're gonna be getting something in the middle and that's gonna give you this amount of deviation. Does that make sense to everybody? There's articles on it and everything if you'd like to read about it, but it's a way to, to figure it out if you are going into production that, hey, you know, these tolerances are too tight or we're gonna hit this um, it gives you some important information. Also, when you're looking at this, we can play around with the precision up at the top. And it also shows you exactly what dimensions are involved. So this tolerance is one that was involved. This tolerance. So each part, it shows you this is the tolerance I'm using. This is affecting your stack. If you want to share this with other people, you can hit export results. It'll save out as an Excel uh, sheet, which is great if we weren't always using sheets here. So I don't use the Excel, but it does give you a web page, the ability to create a web page quickly. So if I were to save that, I can send that HTML file to somebody and they can open this up in a browser. It shows you all the information that I was just telling you about, the highs and lows, the RSS, all that. It also goes through every part and tells you which surface it's taking, what the, you know, which datum it's using to measure off of, and what the tolerance is that's affecting that stack. So that is saved into the part. You can always uh, bring up the results later on, uh, or you can right click and edit it if you wanna change it. You can even put in more than one study. Now, if I'm worried about you know the distance between the two uh, pistons, how is my tolerance affecting that? I can start doing other studies inside the same part, but that is the nickel tour of the tall analyst. Any questions? No, <laughs> I'm looking at somebody. No, you guys. All right. So you see, it's got pluses and minuses. It does a lot of great math for you. 
simplified would be better, especially you saw I was having the problem with some of the more complex geometry. It was just going way out of its way, finding way too many edges and faces and things that could be measured off of. Uh, so keep it simple and it does help you out. It's a tool you already have. So if you're doing tolerance stacks and you're worried about them, try this out or you have any problems, just let me know and I'll be happy to help you out. Does it do like an overall stack? So if I have a bunch of components that I'm trying to, say, put into a cylinder, I want to make sure that a maximum material is all going to fit together and they're all going to fit the big enclosed envelope. Is that something that this tool does? Because that's kind of what I was expecting to see, to see other than solvers going crazy with all these GD and T symbols. Okay, so the, the meat of the question was, uh, can I do something like fill up a, a barrel full of stuff and see if the stuff, the tolerances are going to poke out of the barrel kind of thing? It's the same idea. If you have the stack that you're putting in your barrel, um, as long as they're mated together and each one of those items inside the stack has a tolerance, it'll work. And you can pick the top, you can pick the barrel itself and so it'll, you know, you say, just like I did here, where I was picking the top of the cylinder, <laughs> rather than the cylinder head, you'd be picking the top of your barrel. Rather than the top of the piston head, you'd pick whatever the top item is in that barrel, and then just say all of those items are gonna be stacked, and it'll give you a plus, it'll give you a minus, and then you can figure out uh, whether or not it's gonna fit in there. Can you do this in an apartment as well? No, it, it, uh, it does have to work in an assembly. So I knew that people would, people would, yeah. Okay. So his question is, can you start doing tall stack ups uh, inside of a part? Because uh, tolerance stacks happen inside of a single part too. If you dimension off something that's dimensioned, now you get two tolerances if both of those dimensions have tolerances and it can start to stack up if you keep doing like a chain dimension instead of an ordinate dimension. Um, it does not do that in, in this. So this really has to be separate components. It can't do multi-bodies or things like that. Um, also, this thing has shortcomings, as you saw. <laughs> um, so there is a, a product called TASIS that people use, people that do like uh, lasers and microwaves and stuff that you need to be in there dialed in lots of the decimal places out. Uh, and not only that, but within the part, things have to be exactly in the right location for the whole trick to work. So people that have those needs where their parts need to have uh, analysis, they'll get that add in. It's called TASIS. Uh, it's pretty expensive, but it does multi-body, it does in part, it does this a lot easier than the SOLIDWORKS version. Um, but unfortunately, to answer your question, no, it does not do parts with this tool. Yes, sir. I've got a question. After I've gone through all this and I've, and I've done all my GDT and I've got it all figured out. Does it transfer to a drawing and does it give me a clean drawing? Does it actually put the data to the views that which would make the most sense? Does it can basically um, duplicate what I could do on paper? Right. So the question uh, that was just posed to me is, yeah. look at all these beautiful dimensions. Do I need to do those again on the drawing? I did them when I built the part. I did them for this. Now I want to make a drawing. Do I need to do all that part stuff again? You don't, but you do need to know exactly what you're doing here. So what it does is it tries to put the, the stuff cleanly in there. It doesn't do a great job. Um, so sometimes you have to go in here and kind of separate it out so you can actually read it. Um, what I like to do is I like to use, you know, these, the top, front, and right things to try and get these sort of into the location that I want them to be in when I go into the drawing. A couple of things. You may put these on and see them vanish instantly. What? What happens there is you need to make sure that you are set up to show annotations. If that is turned off, you can put them in there and they disappear as you're putting them in there, which will drive you crazy. Also, they can be turned off globally. Make sure that is not happening. Okay, one more layer because your question was, can I put this in a drawing? The answer is yes. Let me save it so I can save exactly where I put those models. Um, and I'll open 
hopefully just a blank drawing. It's probably going to put a glob of dimensions for me. I'm not going to lie to you. But uh, you can put them in there. But when you do, you have to tell it that you want those imported. Mm, so you've got to check that on. you got to check that on. If you check this on as well, then you get your DIM expert on top of all your parametric dimensions, and now you've got a, way too much stuff. So it's one of those things, if you're going to use this, you have to decide which one are you going to use. Are you going to use the stuff from the model, or are you going to use the stuff from the MBD? All right. So do those look stacked like you were hoping? <laughs> It looks exactly like you thought it was going to do. Yeah, it's it's. I, I, these are a little better because I cleaned them up, but they're even still pretty horrible right now. Um, those can disappear instantly because you can also set the annotations at this level, whether or not you're going to see them. So, um, I believe you can move them within the drawing. Yeah, okay. you can, which is good because. So you can start cleaning it up. Um, there are some tricks you can do, um, like this type of stuff where you can do uh, try and do spacing. So there's some stuff to automatically put the spacing in, but it comes in like you were worried, Monty, right on top of everything. Um, so this whether you're going to put this into a drawing, I don't really think it it's worth it. I, I usually think because this is MBD, this is supposed to be, you're not going to be doing a drawing. Still something in, in the future, but it's another reason um, that they've got people sort of leveraging this is you need to put in this, this MBD stuff in order to do the tall analyst. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Thanks everybody for coming. I'm going to do another one of these next month. If you have any ideas for topics you'd like to see covered, just drop me an email uh, and maybe you'll see your topic next question. month. You asked for questions. I did uh, ask for questions. Are we going to have the recording for this? Because I've been getting hit up a lot today for, uh, for, for uh, processing this uh, video mm -hmm. and putting it up on the site. So Monty's question was, when is the video for this going to be available on our go slash x dash mechanical website? And that is going to be tomorrow. So after I'm finished with this, they spool it, they send it tomorrow morning. I'm going to have to edit the end and beginning out, and then I'll post it up on our channel and send it out to everybody. Okay. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming.